also be presenting. Uh, yeah, I will also be presenting some um, PowerPoint uh, images, uh, not too many. Um, anyway, tonight's talk is about Bowen, the, the goddess, the deity. She is very strongly connected with the River Boyne, the Boyne Valley, the monument complex of Brunabonia and specifically Newgrange. Tonight's talk is almost exclusively based upon a book that I published this year called Bowen, the Goddess of the River Boyne and the Milky Way. That's number two in the Mythical Ireland monograph series, which currently runs to a total of two volumes, <laughs> but I'm hoping to add more in uh, 2022. I have plans for two more monographs. All I need now is the time and the energy to sit down and write them. Uh, anyway, you're all very welcome. So uh, I'll give a brief introduction and then we'll get into specifics in relation to Bowen. I'm going to share my uh, presentation. Pardon me for a moment while I just organize that. I did a test before admitting everyone. So hopefully this will work fairly Uh, hopefully. Perhaps somebody could give us the thumbs up. Are you able to see? Yeah, you can see that. Um, uh, oh, mm, not sure that that. Are you also seeing the Zoom messages about two people entering the waiting room? Or is that just me that's seeing that? Yeah, that's, that's a little bit uh, awkward anyway. Okay, I'll press on. So um, Bowen, a diminished deity is how I begin. It is perhaps an unfortunate circumstance that Bowen's renown resides in aspects that diminish her significance as one of the deities of the Tua de Danon. She is best known for defying the taboos relating to the well controlled by her husband, Necton, and for drowning in the ensuing inundation that burst from the well forming the River Boyne. Her other claims to fame are that she was mother of Angus and wife of the aforementioned Necton, and is sometimes treated in the literature almost as if she did not possess any unique or redeeming qualities of her own. The intent of this talk is to present a comprehensive portrayal of Bowen from all the manuscript sources about her and to depict her as a deity in her own right who has immense significance to the early mythological history of the Boyne Valley. Her cosmology suggests that she was far more than just a temeritous wife or concubine who brought catastrophe upon herself. Drawing upon a wide assortment of sources, we can see that Bowen was a primordial figure who, in the far off dream time of a very ancient pre-Christian insular culture, was a deity of preeminence whose roles in creation mythology set her aside as a divinity of supreme standing and whose luster was perhaps diminished by the deadening hands of male ecclesiastical scribes of the Middle Ages, and over time, whose significance was devalued. Um, let me just stop that for a moment. I don't know. Uh, uh, okay, everybody, everybody says looking good. That's grand. Just want to make sure that everybody who is here is here. So who was Bowen? Bowen is often described as the eponymous goddess of the river Boyne. She gave her name to the river after a fateful episode in which she approached her husband Necton's well and walked around it three times anti-clockwise, causing the well to erupt and carry her a long distance away to the sea where she drowned. Her name is spelled several different ways. In the metrical Dinchanicus, she is Boand, B-O-A-N-D, but other common forms include Bowen, B-O-F-A-I-N-N, and Boan, B-O-F-A-N-N. She does not generally appear in stories that are not associated with the Boyne River Valley and its monuments. Her name is said to derive from the Irish words bow, meaning cow, and fin or finned, meaning white, bright, fair, or illuminated. The earliest written mention of her name in association with the river occurs in Ptolemy's 2nd century AD map of Ireland in the form of Buvinda, and that map may have been based on older sources. Uh, just admitting the uh, latecomers, <laughs> uh, nothing ever starts on time in Ireland. Bowen 
may have meant illuminated cow, which lends itself to the notion of some form of bovine goddess. Dahi Ohogoin suggests that Bowen might have been the wisdom giving cow associated with the archetypal seer, because the old word word vind or find or fin, which forms the second part of her name, has a range of meanings from the color white to illumination and wisdom. It has been suggested that the variant colors of cattle in Irish mythology represent different phases of the moon, and this author has proposed that one of her forms is as a lunar goddess. The gestation period of the cow is tied with lunar cycles. She was the wife of Necton or Elkmar, but had an affair with Dagda, which resulted in the miraculous birth of Angus Og. Bowen had a lapdog a lap whose name was Dabila, and place name lore suggests the dog drowned with Bowen when the Boyne reached the sea and was dashed against two rocks which form the islands of Rockabill off the coast of County Dublin. An alternative name for Bowen is Ethna or Ethlu, uh, which who in one story comes into the brew, that's Newgrange, in the guise of a lapdog. Her pivotal role in the creation mythology of the Boyne involving her dismemberment Distinguish her, distinguishes her as an extremely ancient and eminent primordial deity. Just want to show you something here in the slides here for a moment. If we can move on the... Yes, Anthony, you need to click share. That's... Um, so it's just some contemporary portrayals of Bowen. Uh, I think you'll find these interesting because oftentimes we read about the deities in the myths, but we have, it's very difficult maybe to form a picture. This is by the artist Jane Brideson and this image uh, and several others are featured in my book, Newgrange Monument to Immortality. Uh, a beautiful portrayal, I think you'll agree because it connects, you see the, reflection of the Boyne and the Milky Way, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit. You see Newgrange represented there, and you also see the sacred salmon of the Boyne. Uh, this is Bowen by Jim Fitzpatrick. Uh, Jim, a very uh, uh, well-known, uh, very famous uh, artist, uh, Irish artist, I think you'll agree. And uh, a recent one from the Bio Coffee Shop in Dulic in County Meath, which is just a few miles out the road here, and just a few miles from Newgrange. Um, very interesting to see uh, 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 mo modern portrayals of this very ancient uh, deity. Uh, and we spoke about there, uh, the diminished deity. That is a photograph of uh, Necton's well, which is uh, associated, today it's known as Trinity Well. It's located in Carberry in County Kildare. And the source of the Boyne is very, very close to this well. The streams that run off the hill here at Carberry, uh, at Sheenachthan, are the... Uh, the, the first inklings of the River Boyne, uh, which is fascinating. We spoke about who Bowen was. I was supposed to be showing you these slides as I was talking. I do apologize. Uh, and there's a white cow. So uh, there is her uh, in one of her guises as a white uh, or a bright or illuminated cow. And also we spoke about um, the idea of uh, the connection with the moon and the lunar cycles. The Boyne River rises in the vicinity of the village of Carberry in County Kildare, a fact which is all the more interesting given the mythological assertion that the Boyne rises at Necton's Well, and we saw that a couple of moments ago, which is identified with the modern Trinity Well in the grounds of Newbury Demean near Carberry. The Boyne has been described as probably the most dominant physical feature in Meath. The river and its tributaries drain more than 70% of that country. The river has played an important role in the history and mythology of Ireland. It served as a major transport route for the builders of the great monument complex of Brunabonia over 5,000 years ago. In myth, the Milesians were said to have landed at the Boyne estuary when they came to claim Ireland from the Tua de Danon. Christianity came to Ireland according to tradition when St. Patrick sailed up the Boyne to Slane, where he lit the Paschal fire in 432 AD. And of course, the armies of William uh, of Orange and King James II clashed in the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. There's a picture of the Boyne as it loops around the great complex of Brunabonia. You can hopefully see uh, Newgrange there on the peak. And down here in the mist is uh, Mound B, also known as Dogda's Mound. And we talk about Dogda as well. A great deal of what we know about the deity Bowen is related to us in the Dinshanicus 
a diverse collection of medieval metrical and prose material elucidating the lore of eminent ancient places found in a number of medieval manuscripts. A principal purpose of the Dinshenicus material appears to be to relate the origin and meaning of names of the names of important or sacred places in Ireland. There are two poems about Bowen referring to both the uh, river Boyne and the deity in the metrical Dinshenicus, and these are titled Boand 1 and Boand 2. Prose versions of these can be found in a manuscript in the Library of Wren and in the Bodleian Library at Oxford University. The first portion of the poem Boand 1 appears to represent an attempt to enumerate 15 names of the Boyne from its source in the She or the Otherworld Mound of Mechthon until it reaches the quote unquote paradise of Adam. The first portion of the poem Boand 1 appears to represent an attempt, sorry I did say that, Sagish was her name in the She to be sung by thee in every land and of course one of the names for the well that gave rise to the Boyne uh, was Segish, also known as Necton's Well, now known as Trinity Well. River of Segish is her name from that point to the pool of Mochua, the cleric, from the well of righteous Mochua to the bounds of Mead's wide plain. The arm of Nuadu's wife and her leg are the two noble and exalted names, and we'll help to explain those names shortly. From the bounds of goodly Meath till she reaches the sea's green floor, she is called the Great Silver Yoke and the White Marrow of Phelimid. Segish is one of the names given to the source of the Boyne and also the source of the River Shannon. Its location appears to be either underground or in an otherworld mound. The Well of Segish was said to be surrounded by nine magic hazel trees, whose know or hazelnuts fell into the water feeding the salmon of knowledge. Segish, by the way, can mean pleasure, joy, or delight. The subsequent four quatrains of the poem, Boand One, suggest that the River Boyne was connected to other rivers in Ireland and some of the great rivers of the world, including the Severn in the land of the Sound Saxons, in Tiber, sorry, the Tiber, the Jordan, and the Euphrates. Thus, a circular motion which imagines the Boyne rising under the sea or in the other world, flowing across Ireland and the surface of the world and returning back again hither to the streams of this she is portrayed. Um, pardon me for a second. Um, yes, let me just show that again. Apologies. I'll be toing and froing between the sharing of the screen and the and the not sharing of the screen. Uh, this one is called uh, the creation myth of the Boyne. And so uh, many of you will be familiar with the story, but I will uh, summarize it. Uh, Bowen is said to have gone to the well of her husband, Necton. No one was permitted to go near the well except for Necton and his three cup bearers, who are all men. And Bowen decides that she's going to test its power. And uh, she walks around it three times um, with her shins or uh, uh, Tool instead of Jeshel, right hand wise, following the course of the sun, she goes anti sun wise, which was a taboo. Necton, son of Lowry and husband of Bowen, had a secret well from which emanated in Irish, Kech Mirun, every evil secret and mystery. Uh, and of course, bear in mind with all this that because a lot of this uh, material uh, was. Uh, uh, written down by Christian monks, that some of it may have been altered uh, by those uh, ecclesiastical scribes. There was none that would look to its bottom, but his two eyes would burst. If he should move to left or right, he would not come from it without blemish. Therefore, none of them dared approach it, save Necton and his cupbearers. These are their names, famed for brilliant deed, flesk, and love, and love. There was a taboo or prohibition upon the secret well of Necton. No one could look to the bottom of the well without his eyes bursting, and no one dared approach it except Necton and his three cupbearers. It is notable that the guardians of the well, presumably the only ones who can approach it safely, were all male. Hither came, and this is a, again from the uh, Metrical Dinshanicus, hither came on a day white Boand, 
her noble pride uplifted her to the never failing well to make trial of its power. It is clear that Bowen was attempting to bypass or circumvent the proscription that disallowed anyone other than Necton and his three cupbearers to enter the secret arena. The, um, the Bodleian manuscript, which is one of the prose versions, tells us that Bowen went to the well alone with pride and haughtiness, and that, and she said that it had no secret power, sorry, it had no secret or power unless it could disgrace her shape. What is the secret power of the well and why does Bowen feel compelled to challenge, challenge its potency? The well is seen to serve as a sacred boundary marker, showing a path to another world. There is also a theme implicit in a similar Dinshanicus tale about the River Shannon of secret knowledge reached beyond the watery threshold. And this again is from the Dinshanicus. As thrice she walked round about the well heedlessly, three waves burst from it. Whence came the death of Boand? Bowen was apparently careless in the manner in which she approached the well. However, the prose versions relate that she walked around the well three times tuhal, uh, left hand wise, anti clockwise, with her shins or against the sun. The implication is that, contrary to being careless, there was a contrived stratagem in Bowen's movement around the well, which was in clear breach of established custom and convention. Clearly, there is an imperative here in which the feminine deity transgresses the constrictions or prohibitions of the all-male caste. One can rarely determine with absolute certainty upon reading the Dinshanicus, which elements might have been inserted by ecclesiastical scribes. Was the haughty Bowen portrayed by the mon monastic literati as an Irish Eve? The metrical Dinshanicus poem Boand II infers that Bowen went to the well after her adulterous affair with the Dogda at Newgrange, where the child Angus was conceived and born in a single day, in order to conceal her guilt. Boand, and this is a quote from Boand II, Boand went from the house in haste to see if she could reach the well. She was sure of hiding her guilt if she could attain to bathe in it. Is the notion of adultery, of sin and penance, and the associated premise of bathing in the well in order to achieve a form of absolution, a Christian incursion into the story of the creation of the Boyne. Because the scribes were religious men compiling their manuscripts in a monastery environment, it should be no wonder that, quote, material of a pious nature was interspersed, unquote, and that's from Michael Slavin, uh, who wrote uh, the the ancient books of Ireland with the overtly pagan mythological content. A third poem featuring the story of Bowen's approach to the well and its subsequent eruption and the formation of the River Boyne, composed by Kinnaid Uhartakon, or Kenneth Hartigan, as we might call him these days, and preserved in the Book of Leinster, places greater emphasis on the notion of Bowen's adultery with Dagda being a fault or a dishonor requiring penance or chastisement. Elkmar, upon returning to the brew, having been sent on an errand to my Inish by Dagda, so that Dagda in turn could lie with Bowen, accused his sister of adultery with the Dagda. Hide thy fault and I will conceal it, Dagda told Bowen, adding, deny it and I will do the same. Twere ill that thine unfaithfulness should be cast up to thy face, which is fascinating. Uh, this is uh, Dagda, who's just uh, slept with Boan uh, behind uh, Elkmar's back. And he's basically saying, uh, you know, that uh, her unfaithfulness uh, will be cast up uh, to her face as if he had no role whatsoever in it. The poem Boan too suggests that Bowen went to Necton's well in order to conceal her guilt by bathing in its waters. And here is one of the quatrains. To them came gentle Boan, Toward the well in sooth, the strong fountain rose over her and drowned her finally. The third poem mentioned above, which we will call Boand Three for convenience, quotes Bowen thus. I will make my way to the pleasing Segish to prove my chastity beyond doubt. Thrice shall I walk wither shins around the living water inviolate. 
However, this course of penitentiary action fails and the well erupts, pursuing her across the land as the river is formed. The creation myth of the Boyne is mirrored in the story of the formation of the River Shannon. In the latter, a female deity of the Tua de Danon called Shinnon approaches a mystical well named Segish in the metrical Dinchanicus in pursuit of arcane knowledge. She is drowned where the stream from Segish meets the river bank and becomes, quote, the eponymous spirit of the river, unquote. And pardon me for a moment while I just show, I think the next slide, yes, is important. Apologies for the toing and froing. Uh, and so what you're seeing there is actually an image from uh, Sumero-Babylonian myth. Some of you may be familiar with the story of the slaying of Tiamat by Marduk. And this will become interesting to us. That and many other stories of dismemberment, which are told uh, in uh, the ancient myths. Bowen's dismemberment by the rushing waters is not merely a destructive, injurious act. It is a creative one, too. Stretches of the river are named for the body parts of which she is deprived. And you remember uh, when we started the first quote from the Dinchanicus, we said that the Boyne in stretches was called the arm of Nuadu's wife and her leg. And in this happenstance, we are able to perceive aspects of ancient cosmology from other parts of Europe and indeed further afield, contained in similar creation myths in which a deity or monster is killed or, and dismembered, its body parts forming the new cosmos. And this is a quote from Witzel, that's world mythology, the shamanistic aspect of the religion of the Stone Age hunter societies presupposes the dismemberment and or sacrifice of a primordial deity. Early man frequently turned, this is from uh, Philip Freund, early man frequently turned to the idea that the fashioning of the vast world involved the killing or suicidal self-sacrifice of a god or supernatural giant. The universe is formed of the parts of Panku, Purusha, Emir, Viraj, Tiamat, the aforementioned Tiamat, Ferwan, uh, Yamaji, Izanagi, etc., etc., and the list goes on. In fact, it, it turns out that there are five major themes. If you look at world mythology and you look at creation mythology, there are five major themes. You will know the theme from Genesis, well, most of you will, uh, of the great flood that was brought upon mankind uh, to as a punishment, and only a, a couple of people and some animals survive in a boat. That story is told all around the world in different forms. Another one is the edict, and you will again know that from Genesis and God said, let there be light, etc., etc. Well, one of those five creation myth themes is dismemberment. And the dismemberment, uh, as I said, sacrifice, uh, suicidal self-sacrifice, etc., of a, a, a god or deity, a giant, a monster in some cases. Can we now add Bowen to this list? Was her death and disfigurement or dismemberment a necessary preface to the creation? of a new world. Dismemberment is an indisputable theme of the story of the fate of the monster Mata, whose name may or may not be related to the Irish word Maher, meaning mother. And indeed the Mata's fate also seems entirely and inevitably bound up with the River Boyne. In fact, the thematic similarities between the fates of Bowen and Mata are so stark that this author considers them to be distorted variants of one archaic origin myth. And if you want to read more about Mata, I recommend in particular my book, Mythical Ireland, we'll mention that at the end as well, just in terms of sources. The prose version in the Wren manuscript goes like this, uh, and this is in relation to the naming of Auclea, Dublin. When the men of Aaron broke the limbs of the Mate, it's spelt differently, as Boan is spelt differently, uh, and many of the names in manuscripts, uh, they vary from manuscript to manuscript. The monster that was slain on the Leach Ben in the Brew Mackindog, that's Newgrange, they threw it limb by limb into the Boyne, 
and its shin bone, its culpa, that's the Irish word, got to Inverculpa, the estuary of the Boyne, whence Inverculpa is said. And the hurdle of its frame, i.e. its breast, went along the sea, coasting Ireland, till it reached Yon Ford, Aw, whence Auclea is said. In other words, the rib cage of the monster, the Mata, which had been cut into pieces at Newgrange, was thrown into the Boyne, and it had floated out to sea and arrived into the estuary of the Liffey, and it landed in the, in the Liffey where the ford of the Liffey is Auclea. It is implicit here that Mata licked up the Boyne because it actually specifically says in the metrical Dinchenicus that Mata licked up the Boyne until it became a valley. It presum presumably meaning that it drank all the water until the river was gone and all that was left was a dry valley. In both myths, the story of Bowen's flight from Necton's well and that of the killing of the Mata, there was a deprivation of water, or at the very least, a situation in which the river valley was either dry or had not yet been formed. And there was dismemberment, leading to the naming of landscape features from the disarticulated or mutilated parts. Bowen's death by drowning occurred at the river estuary known as Inverculta, which is one of two riverine features named from major dismembered parts of the Mata, namely its shin or shank. Here, the thematic resonances continue. Apart from the fact that the entire river is named after Bowen, the only disarticulated parts of her which give rise to names of segments of the river are her arm and her leg. In both, in both instances, where a stretch of river is named after the dismembered leg, the word for the leg is the same, culpa. And here is a quote directly from the Dinshanicus. Re mna nuadat is a culpa, a da anam ona imarda. The arm of Nuadu's wife and her leg are the two noble and exalted names. The grave, and here is a separate uh, quatrain, the, gra the grave of the Matha after his slaying is plain to see on thee, O brew, studded with horses. The sea has rotted his bone, whence pleasant Inverculpa is named. In Dingni in Broga, the monuments of the brew, in the Wren prosed in Shanicus, we have Lectin Mate is the occulta Reicher Inverculpa, the monument of the Mata from its culta shinbone. Uh, Inverculta is called. Despite the fact that Bowen was drowned at the river estuary some 19 kilometres or almost 12 miles downstream of Brunabonia, and her dog was swept away as far as Rockabill Islands, which is about 40 kilometres or 23 miles, she also had a monument or burial mound in the Brunabonia complex, according to Dingney and Broga, um, uh, the monuments of the Bru. Uh, and, and the specific reference is here, the tomb of Bowen, wife of Nechton, son of Nuada, Nuada. Tis she that brought with her the little hound named Dabila, whence Dabila's hill is so called. To summarize, and this is just this section, this is not the end of the talk, sorry. <laughs> I hope you're not falling asleep. Uh, to summarize, there are aspects of the stories of Bowen and Mata that suggest they are distorted variants of an early cosmogonic myth. Both are intimately linked with the Boyne. Bowen is perhaps seen to create the river's course as she flees the erupting waters of Necton's well, while Mata licks up the river to make it a dry river valley. Both are dismembered. Bowen loses an eye, an arm and a leg, or two thighs in the Tuckmark Emira version, and her arm and leg give their names to portions of the River Boyne. The Mata is cut to pieces on a mysterious stone at Newgrange and thrown into the Boyne. Its leg or shank or shin bone forms the Boyne estuary in Verculpa, which is incidentally where Bowen was drowned. The Mata's rib cage floats out to sea and finds its way to the River Liffey, where it forms the ford there. Bowen may have been a primordial mother deity, a uh, mag magna mater, the creatrix, mother of the universe, so to speak. And Mata's name may be related to the Irish word Maher. So, uh, quite regularly, Mata is spelt with a, a fada on the first A, Mata. Uh, and I'm suggesting a relationship to Maher, mother. Both are commemorated with monuments at Brunabonia. And there are aspects of the story of the dismemberment uh, of Bowen and the creation of the Boyne, which may reflect a concern with the Milky Way and astronomical alignments, which will be explored further on. And let me just find where we're talking about Bowen and Dagda and Angus.
uh, very familiar, I think you'll agree, a very familiar um, feature of uh, Newgrange, the famous tri-spiral, uh, triple spiral, not, <coughs> excuse me, not found <coughs> in megalithic art in any other monument. Another of the most familiar aspects of the somewhat incomplete biography of Bowen is her illicit relationship with the Dagda and the miraculous birth of their son, Angus Og, who is also known as Mach in the Og. The story appears in various manuscript sources and has many nuances, which include some confusion about the identity of Bowen's husband and brother. Bowen was the wife of Nechton, owner of the mysterious well of She Nechton, but in some stories she was married to Elkmar, original master of Sheed and Broga, that's Newgrange. Scholars have suggested that both Nechton and Elkmar are pseudonyms of the Tuatadana deity, Nuada Arakatlov, Nuadu of the Silver Arm. Dagda was a chief deity of the Tuatadana, also known as Yochi Olahar, the father of many. We'll just, pardon me while I just mute that person, apologies. In Roa Rohesa, the Lord of Great Knowledge, and also, I love this one, Re Feiklina, the king of Feik's Pool. And Feik's Pool is that uh, little place on the Boyne River uh, at the bend of the Boyne between Rosnery and Nouth, uh, uh, where the Salmon of Knowledge was said to have been caught. So I'm going to read from Tuchmark Eitain. Elkmar of the Brew had a wife whose name was Ethna, and another name for her was Boand. The Dagda desired her in carnal union. The woman would have yielded to the Dagda had it not been for fear of Elkmar, so great was his power. Thereupon the Dagda sent Elkmar away on a journey to Bress, son of Elatha, in Maininish. And the Dagda worked great spells on Elkmar as he set out, that he might not return betimes, that is, early. And he dispelled the darkness of night for him, and he kept hunger and thirst from him. He sent him on long errands, so that nine months went by as one day. For he had said that he would return home again between day and night. Meanwhile, the dog that went in upon Elkmar's wife, and she bore him a son, even Angus, and the woman was whole and her sickness when Elkmar, sorry, was whole of her sickness when Elkmar returned, and he perceived not her offence, that is, that she had lain with the dog that. Now, there are different versions of this story, and we will get to that. Dagda sent Elkmar away on errands and, using magic, contracted time for Elkmar in such a way that he would think he was only away for one day, but in fact, he would be abroad for nine months. Enough time for the Dagda and Bowen to conceive and indeed see the child Angus born. Included in the supernatural wizardry invoked by the Dagda, and perhaps with the help of Bowen, was the miraculous halting of the sun, such that it was made to stand still in the sky for nine months. <clears throat> Pardon me. It is apparent that their union occurred within the Newgrange Monument, referred to as the House of Elkmar in the Metrical Denchanicus. And the Metrical Denchanicus poem Boand II tells us the following. Thither from the south came Boand, wife of Necton, to the love tryst, to the house of Elkmar, lord of horses, a man that gave many a good judgment. Thither came by chance the Dagda into the house of famous Elkmar. He fell to importuning the woman. He brought her to the birth in a single day. It was then they made the sun stand still to the end of nine months. Strange the tale warming the noble ether in the roof of the perfect firmament. Then said the woman here, union with thee, that were my one desire. And the Irish for one desire apparently is Angus, that's where he gets his name. And Angus shall be the boy's name, said the Dagda in noble wise. <clears throat> and so, I just want to be careful that I'm not going to repeat myself here. What we're seeing there, I think, is uh, couched in uh, symbolic language is a description of the winter solstice illumination of the chamber of Newgrange, the sun deity basically mating with the earth mother, who's represented by this very organic, uterine, swollen belly, womb-like uh, structure that we call Newgrange. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll take a, a drop of water. 
water's from the Boyne, by the way. All the drinking water in Drogheda comes from the Boyne River. It's treated first. <laughs> I have previously speculated that the New Grange Triple Spiral might represent a divine Neolithic trinity, Dagda, Father, Son, Bowen, Mother Earth, and Angus Og, the Miracle Child. The poem Boand Three adds confusion to the relationships of the story because in it, Boan, Boan is Elkmar's sister, not his wife. And it is apparent that she lived in Newgrange with him. And I'm quoting here, Boan, wife of fierce Necton, came without sorrow thither. No, sorry, uh, pardon me. I wasn't supposed to quote that. I'll just proceed. This poem portrays Alkmar as quite a possessive and zealous protector of his sister, refusing Dogda's advances on her behalf. This is evident from Lucius Gwynne's useful summary of the tale. And Lucius Gwynne was the one who had written uh, and, and translated that poem that we've been referring to as Boand Three. Boand, the wife of Necton, came to stay with her brother Elkmar, vassal and ambassador of the Dogda, king of Ireland. The Dogda saw her and sent thrice to demand her of her brother, but Elkmar refused him and stayed to keep watch over her during her stay in the brew. The three druid messengers whom the Dagda had sent returned to inform him of this and counselled him to obtain his end by sending Elkmar on an errand away from the home. Elkmar, when summoned, was unwilling to leave his sister, but consented on condition that he should not be sent too far to return before night to his home. So the Dagda sent him to Bres MacElathan in Maininish to demand of him a woman who should watch over his household charging that prince to feast and entertain his envoy. Meantime, the Dagda, by secret spells, held the sun in the heavens for nine months, so that the whole time seemed to Elkmar, as he sat at his ale, like a single day. Pardon me. Meanwhile, the Dagda was with Boand at the brew, and at the end of nine months, Boand bore a son, a son to the Dagda, whom, whom they named Angus Mac, in Makog. Then Elkmar, on his way home, saw the strange advance in the seasons on the flowers of the hillside. He hastened his return, and the Dogda and Boan parted in haste and fear, leaving the child behind them at the wayside. So one of the things to just really pay attention to here in, in this description is the fact that Dogda and Bowen are basically uh, mating at Newgrange. And at a time when they've magically made the sun stand still in the sky. And what is the solstice except for that time of year, the two times of year, when the sun appears to stand still on the horizon because it stops moving. Its rising position in the southeast is uh, at a standstill for several days before it turns back again with the advancing of the year. In 2020, Newgrange made international news headlines when modern forensic science revealed something remarkable about an adult male who had been interred in the chamber of the monument over 5,000 years ago. And by the way, that picture that you see there of the light streaming in, uh, uh, that's pictured from the end recess. And this man's remains were found towards the uh, recess that you would be looking at on the left, uh, as, as we see it there, the left, uh, or it's, it's the right-hand recess as you enter. Uh, from the passage. Something remarkable about an adult male who had been interred in the chamber of the monument over 5,000 years ago. Something which is hinted at in the mythology of Newgrange and its sister monument, Douth. Genomic science demonstrated that this male possessed multiple long runs of homozygosity, which marked him as the offspring of a first order incestuous union, which is a near universal taboo for entwined biological and cultural reasons. And I'm quoting there from a paper by Lara Cassidy and several others that was published in the journal uh, uh, Nature in 2020. In other words, this man had parents who were either siblings, i.e. brother and sister, or parent and offspring. The study published in the journal Nature said that, quote, the only known definitive acceptances of such mating occur among siblings, specifically within polygynous elites as part of a rarely observed phenomenon known as royal or dynastic incest. Both the stories of Douth and Newgrange, as they are contained in the Dinchenicus, involve the King of Ireland, in the case of the former, Bresal Bodibad, and in the latter, Dagda. 
While the theme of incest is explicit in the Denshenicus myth, and I didn't read that section because I feared that the talk would go on too long if I included too much detail, um, you can see that uh, on, on the Mythical Ireland website uh, in the Denshenicus section. It is only tenuously implied in the myths about Newgrange, deriving from the uncertainty about Bowen's relationship with Elkmar. A hypothesis about the stories relating to Bowen and Newgrange could be proposed on the basis of this equivocation over the status of Bowen, Bowen's relationship to Elkmar. This supposition speculates that Bowen and Elkmar were in fact siblings, as stated in the poem Boan III, and that it was they who conceived the child Angus together. Furthermore, the mythological themes of sending away, the sending away of Elkmar under a magic spell and the union of Dagda and Bowen were introduced to give rise to the notion that the offspring, Angus Machindog, was the son of the gods. The hypothesis envisages that the Angus of myth was a real human being, the one buried in Newgrange, whose DNA shows first degree incestuous parentage, who was later identified in the mythology pertaining to the monuments. While such a notion is undeniably tenuous and essentially unprovable, it correlates to a degree with the inhumed remains found in Newgrange, whose parents were likely to have been siblings. The possibility, no matter how slim, remains that Angus was indeed a real individual who was late, later euhumorized in the lore of the great passage tombs of Brunabonia. And that is, uh, 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 as I say, uh, uh, overtly um, speculative on my part, but I did think that it was curious that the equivocation around the relationship of Bowen and Elkmar was interesting. Uh, and the fact that the male uh, interred in Newgrange is hardly, li hardly likely to have ended in there by accident. By the way, those remains, uh, which were labeled by the scientists NG10, uh, were also carbon dated, and they were carbon dated to, I think, 5,200 years ago, 3,200 BC which is the time frame that Newgrange was built in, according to archaeologists. One thing that remains to be examined in the case of Bowen is the apparent disparity between her clear role as a creatrix or primordial deity involved in cosmogony from her role as mother slash wife slash concubine of the gods, who is portrayed in the medieval literature as an object of desire who lives in fear of the men who appear to control her. The divergence of these roles suggests that the Bowen who created the River Boyne and the one who gave birth to Angus were perhaps once envisaged as separate deities whose stories might uh, have been later blended together by the monastic scribes of the Middle Ages. Of course, there's always a possibility that they had been uh, uh, merged uh, in times previous to uh, when the myths were written down. Trying to move on to the next slide. Pardon me for a second. It doesn't seem to be moving. There we go. Bowen and the Milky Way. It is a well attested fact that one of the indigenous Irish terms for the Milky Way is Bialach na Bofina or Bohart na Bofina, the way of the white cow or the road of the white cow. Although the providence and age of this idiom is unknown, the fact that a native and not imported concept pertaining to the Milky Way survives is noteworthy. Regrettably, this designation does not seem to appear in, in any Irish uh, medieval manuscript. And yet, Bialach na Bofina appears in modern dictionaries as the only phrase in Irish for the Milky Way. This author has previously suggested that the tradition or conceptualization of the Milky Way as a heavenly Boyne River is quite archaic. The notion that the Milky Way was seen as a stream or river through the sky was commonplace throughout history. Uh, now, uh, there are several pages uh, of examples from world mythology, uh, uh, which I'm not going to read. Uh, but again, uh, just in case you're interested, uh, they're all contained. That information is all contained in uh, the, uh, the Bowen monograph. There are two significant stories about the creation of the Boyne River. One involving Bowen, whose name identifies her with a white cow, and the other a great monster or serpent called the Mata. The Milky Way is known in Ireland as the Way of the White Cow or the Road of the White Cow. 
Although there are no traditions relating to the Boyne which explicitly state that the creation stories may relate to the river of the heavens, there is a possibility that because the river and the Milky Way have similar, similar etymological derivations, that these myths do in fact refer to both the terrestrial river and its heavenly counterpart. Another, another designation for the Milky Way in Irish is Arabal Malarach Bóine, the tail or trail of the white mare. This is pertinent to our exploration because of another legendary occurrence involving a white mare and dismemberment. And that, of course, is a very well known uh, and well uh, oft repeated attestation by the Norman churchman and historian Geraldus Cambrensis, Gerald of Wales, uh, who described uh, a king, kingship ritual of the Inale dynasty, the Kinale Conal in Donegal, in which uh, basically the king uh, was seen to mate with a white mare uh, before then slaughtering the beast and dismembering it. Its parts would be thrown into a vat or a bath of water and the king would have to get into said bath and drink the bloody water and eat of the flesh of the dismembered animal and only then when this unrighteous right has been carried out his kingship and dominion have been confirmed uh, and of course there is uh, is it a Samhain ritual in which the Lord Vaughan was said to have called from house to house I think that's a Samhain ritual isn't it or I think it is uh, and, and, and that was basically uh, some form of late uh, folk survival of an earlier myth involving uh, this uh, dismemberment of a horse. And, and so what I'm saying here is it's fascinating that, you know, we have the, the, the Milky Way uh, being the road of the white cow and Bowen, uh, who is the white cow deity, is dismembered in the formation of the Boyne. And we also have a separate description of Milky Way uh, as the trail of the white mare, and the white mare was also one that was dismembered. Fascinating. Although she is not explicitly described in myths in bovine form, the fact that Bowen's name means something like white cow suggests a similar portrayal of the Milky Way as the river, road or way, representing the sprinkled remains of the dismembered white cow. If Bialach or Bohor na Bofina and Arabal Nalarach Bonya were not indigenous names for the Milky Way, we could perhaps dispense with such a notion. But the theme of dismemberment persists, and as we have seen, the great monster called the Matha was also dismembered after it drank the waters of the River Boyne and made it a dry river valley. Does the myth of the Matha also refer, perhaps paradoxically, to the rivers of both sky and earth? We have seen some examples of other cultures referring to the Milky Way as the river or the road of the snake. It is especially interesting that the bright band of the Milky Way is dissected by a ten tenebrous sinuous feature, pardon me, known to astronomers as the dark rift or the great rift. Was this rift in Irish mythology the path or channel cut by the giant serpent-like Matha when it licked up the river Boyne? Likewise, was the story of the dragon-like monster called the Ullifeist, from the Irish Ull, great, and Peist, meaning a fabulous beast, reptile, or monster, cutting the root of the Shannon River, similarly inspired? This is all necessarily speculative, of course, but the Dark Rift is known to feature, you can see it, by the way, in that photograph there, the Dark Rift is running up through the Milky Way, and that is a photograph of the Milky Way taken over the River Boyne uh, between uh, Drogheda and Brunabonia. But this is all necessarily speculative, of course, but the Dark Rift is known to feature in another Irish origin myth about the Milky Way, in which the galaxy is described as Shkriv Chlam Ishnuk, the track of the children of Ishnuk. The two separate branches of the Milky Way are depicted as trees growing out of the graves of two dead lovers, and that's uh, Deirdre and Nisha, which unite or join in a light trail called Shkriyev Klan Ishnak. Could we imagine that another alternative to Bialach na Bofina describing the Milky Way was Shli na, na Ban Galgia, which is translated as the track of the woman warrior, which is how the formation of the Boyne is described in the tale Arnya Fingen. Two further names for the Boyne given in the Dunchanicus, Mor Hwing Aragat, which means the great silver yoke, and Shmir Find Felenhi, 
the white marrow of Philamid, are considered by this author to be possible alternative designations for the Milky Way. Even the fact that Bowen may have taken bovine form is itself interesting because of the long-standing association in various cultures of the galaxy with milk. Milchstrasse, as it's known in Germany. Bowen and wisdom. I'm nearly finished, by the way, folks. We're about perhaps five minutes from, from the end. So if you are intending to ask a question, uh, please do uh, indicate so in the chat. And what I'll do when I'm finished is I'll ask you to unmute and ask your question, if that's OK. A latent theme in the stories of Bowen and Shannon, uh, the formations and the formations of the rivers named after them, the Boyne and the Shannon, is the pursuit of wisdom. And here is a quote. Uh, uh, in early Irish literature, the well of Segish, which is reputed to be the source of the River Boyne, is frequently mentioned because of the hazel trees surrounding it, whose nuts, when they fall into the water, are supposed to be the source of mantic inspiration. And that's from Hull. I just want to find out the publication. Vernum Hull, uh, early Irish Segish in Zeitschrift uh, for Celtic Philology, volume 29. Uh, if you wanted to know the quest, of course, all of the sources, there's quite a comprehensive uh, set of footnotes to this monograph, uh, well over 300, uh, plus a comprehensive bibliography, if you wanted to follow up the sources. The quest for wisdom or sacred knowledge is encountered in the story of Finn and the Salmon of Knowledge, and various accounts of this magic fish with its arcane knowledge suggest that it acquired its great wisdom by eating the sacred hazelnuts of Segish or by in ingesting bubbles released by these nuts. Bowen, according to Dahi O'Hogoin, would originally, this is a quote, would originally have been the wisdom-giving cow associated with the archetypal seer, unquote. And there is comparable imagery in Sanskrit literature in which sacred rivers are symbolized as milk flowing from a mystical cow. He further suggests that Bhuvinda was another name for the great river goddess of the Celts, namely Danu Bovinda, or Danu, the milk giving and inspiring. The bursting of the well, causing Bowen's flight and deformity, represents, quote, the light of inspiration that blinds unquote, according to O'Hogoin. Archaeologist John Waddell says the following, if, as seems likely, the story of the origins of the Boyne is part of an Indo-European tradition, then the sanctity of the river and a particular association with secret knowledge is of great antiquity. And there's lots more in that chapter, but uh, for the purposes of, of compressing things into a, a talk lasting just one hour, uh, we were skipping some of that. But as I say, it's all contained in the monograph and uh, copies are available, signed copies, of course, from the website. Um, the eternal return. If it moves on the next slide, there you go. Water, says Mircha Iliadi, sim symbolizes the whole of potentiality. It is fons et origo, the source of all possible existence. Waters are the, quote, foundations of the whole world and the principle of all healing. This is from uh, Iliadi again. In cosmogony, in myth, ritual and iconography, water fills the same function in whatever type of cultural pattern we find it. It precedes all forms and upholds all creation. Immersion in the water symbolizes a return to the preformal, a total regeneration, a new birth, for immersion means a dissolution of forms, a reintegration into the formlessness of pre-existence, and emerging from the water is a repetition of the act of creation in which form was first expressed. Fascinatingly, Iliadi says that the water symbol was represented on Neolithic vases by the um, uh, zigzag symbols. Uh, which he, he says is the, all, the, all, also the most archaic Egyptian hieroglyph for flowing water. We should not be surprised, therefore, to find this chevron or zigzag pattern to be engraved on numerous stones in the interior and indeed on the exterior of the great monuments of Brunebonia, Newgrange, Nauth and Douth. Bowen's dismemberment in the rushing waters emanating from Segish, creating the new Boyne, 
is as much an act of regeneration as it is a dissolution of forms. While everything is dissolved and broken up in the immersion, quote, water possesses this power of purifying, of regenerating, of giving new birth, for what is immersed in it dies, and rising again from the water is like a child without any sin or any past, able to receive a new revelation and begin a new and real life. And again, that's another uh, Iliadi quote. Most importantly, in relation to our study of Bowen, Iliadi says, says about deluge symbolism. Almost all the traditions of deluges are bound up with the idea of humanity returning to the water whence it had come and the establishment of a new era and a new humanity. They display a conception of the universe and its history as something cyclic. One era is abolished by disaster and a new one opens, ruled by new men. This conception of cycles is also shown by the convergence of the lunar myths with themes of flood, floods and deluges, for the moon is by far the most important symbol of rhythmic development, of death and resurrection. Just as the phases of the moon govern initiation ceremonies in which the neophyte dies to awaken to a new life, so too they are intimately connected with the floods that annihilate the old humanity and set the stage for the appearance of the new. In the story of Bowen's death and the creation of the Boyne, we encounter what students familiar with Iliade's work will know as the myth of the eternal return. And of course, that is the title of probably Iliad, Iliade's best known book. Because Newgrange can function both as a receptacle for the light of the winter solstice sun and the full moon at summer solstice, there is a duplicity of engineering so that the male sun, Dogda, and later Angus Og, and the female moon, Bowen, are seen to periodically die in order that they can take a reinvigorated, renewed form, symbolizing the return to prosperity for the agriculturally minded mound creators. Thus, the passage tombs also become passage wombs, places where the dead go in order to be reborn. There was, says Iliadi, an attempt with these New Year ceremonies to imagine regeneration or new birth. The annual expulsion of sins, diseases and demons is, he suggests, an attempt to restore mythical and primordial time. In other words, the time of the instant of creation. Every new year is a resumption of time from the beginning, i.e. a repetition of the cosmogony. Thus, we can consider the story of Bowen in an entirely new light. Far from being the haughty, jumped-up Irish Eve who took flight to the well in order to somehow absolve herself of the perceived sin, of her perceived sin, should I say, she in fact assumed the hopes of an archaic society for the occasional or periodic dissolution necessary for the restoration of mythical and primordial time, in other words, the time of the instant of creation. There is optimism too, a hope that the cyclical catastrophe that consumes or, or overwhelms the world and the deity has a meaning and above all, that it is never final. And here are my concluding words with which I will conclude and again, if you want to ask questions, please uh, indicate so in the chat and we'll take a few questions. I'd be very glad to do so. Bowen's greatest act, the one for which she is best known, was to symbolize or reactualize the moment of creation. Hers was not a death, not a final disintegration of forms, but rather a birth or rebirth leading to the renewal of the world. And her river flows ever onwards from source to sea and beyond, dissolving into the great storm clouds and returning to the earth with the rain, seeping back into the deep rock of the earth, only to emanate again as the source of one of the great rivers of the world. At night, we see her as the Milky Way, and thus she is seen to be eternal, her sparkling waters ever flowing through the arc of heaven as she watches over the affairs of humans. She has outlived all those who first spoke of her in the far off mists of prehistory, and in the waters of the River Boyne, she is replenished and reborn every day, so as to remain an eternal presence in our lives. 
and thus ends uh, my talk about uh, Boeing uh, this evening. And as I said, uh, the, the principal sources for tonight's talk, well, the principal source is the, uh, the Boeing monograph, Boeing, the goddess of the River Boeing and the Milky Way. It's 13 euros. Uh, a plus postage and packaging on mythicalireland.com. The other being the new revised and expanded edition of Mythical Ireland, just published this month, uh, also available at the website. So um, thank you indeed, everyone. I hope that you have enjoyed the content of the talk. Um, I'm going to see if there are any questions. Yes, Adrian Hume would like to ask a question. So Adrian, I'll, I'll uh, ask you up in a moment. Just want to Ooh, make sure that are there any other questions well we'll take one for starters what tends to happen is people are shy and nobody wants to ask the first question and usually when somebody asks a question then other people step forward bravely and don't worry i won't and joan McHugh wants to ask a question as well okay so adrian uh, i'm going to ask you to unmute and perhaps you would ask your question hi anthony that was fascinating thank you so much um I, i'm just um yeah, so many thoughts occurred to me while you were talking, particularly um, the association with uh, Sanskrit. I mean, I've always thought that the the artwork um, very much resembles, um, you know, the uh, the chakras and the rise of the chakra. And of course, when you mention the snake, then of course, um, the snake is is the Sanskrit symbol um, for for Kundalini, which is the search for knowledge. And that would rise in a sort of um, a cyclical pattern up through the chakras, from base chakra to the top chakra, and it's a search of it's a search for knowledge, and it's basically letting go of the body. So I mean, it all just it all just sort of comes together in a strange way. You talked about the snake in the sky, um, and the, the 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 snake, and then I was looking also at the triple spiral again, and I noticed it was interesting what you said about um, going clockwise around, but the actual triple spiral goes anti-clockwise. So maybe there's something there in terms of, of whatever whatever um, Boeing did, she went the wrong way around it. And again, with the chakras, the, the energy in the, in the energy centers and the chakras is supposed to go um, in a particular direction. You know, if it's going the right way to, to good knowledge and, and sort of moving gradually up through, through, um, through uh, Kundalini until it reaches the, the, the top of the head where everything explodes and, and, you know, you become one with the universe. So I think there is a, I think, I have always felt that there's a big, big association with an ancient um, tradition that came actually from the Sanskrit tradition and sort of came to us somehow with one of these peoples that came into the country and that these are remnants of this tradition. Do you have anything to say about that? Or have you done any research in well, that area? Or would you consider doing some research in that area? I, I would certainly consider it. haven't done a huge amount. But I know that it has been said that, you know, the Indo-European family of languages, that, that Ireland and India are actually yeah. on the periphery of that. And there are similarities there. But fascinatingly, um, the story Altram Chiagavathar, which is a story uh, intimately associated with Newgrange, and one of the, the best known group of stories associated with Newgrange, in that two magical cows are brought to Newgrange from India, which I think is fascinating. Mm. Because remember, in India, you have the Ganges and you also have the sacred cow and all of that stuff. And uh, I, 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 look, I'm not at all surprised. I think when you look at the comparative studies that have been done, mm -hmm. and I'll have to admit that I'm a little bit deficient on that side of things, making the comparisons. The Mata uh, really brought me out in terms of, it brought out that side of me where I wanted to have a look at similar myths around the world. Um, and and uh, sort of Bowen likewise, um, there is this emergence of similar themes in mythology in diverse places around the world, mm -hmm. and there are different suggestions as to how that occurred, uh, and not a discussion probably for tonight because it would take too long, uh, but of course, uh, the scholars would say that it's to do with the, the the gradual movement of peoples and that the stories follow the people. Uh, the Jungian uh, psychologists would say, no, that uh, the images in myth are those that emerge uh, unconsciously, uh, you know, through dreams, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and because of what he called the collective unconscious, in many cases, those uh, symbols are uh, uh, their, um, what's the word? Um, when it emerges um, without any sort of um, without any uh, 
simult uh, spontaneous, yeah, spontaneous, spontaneous yeah. emanations. In other words, that the, the human in question is not contriving them and is not comparing them to anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, they emerge spontaneously in different regions. Um, the whole thing is fascinating. Um, just one, um, uh, one caveat emptor, as it were, is that um, some of the scholars, the medieval scholars, suggest that because of their great knowledge, the, the monastic scribes who had traveled on the continent would have been familiar, for instance, with uh, the Iliad, uh, the stories of Odysseus, uh, probably would have been familiar with some of the Egyptian mythology, certainly would have been familiar with the Bible and, and all of that, and that that helped to influence a lot of the myths. However, there's something about, about Bowen, and especially in relation to the dismemberment aspect, which I believe marks her out as, as something primordial, mm. um, which has been completely neglected because of her treatment in the written mythology, because the treatment is entirely around the nature of her transgression, her sin, and mm -hmm. the idea that she has to uh, be, become penitent uh, for this sin. And then that, in some way, her drowning in the river is like punishment for wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Of course, the dog Christianity. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. The Sanskrit connection is one that I would love to delve deeper into given time, absolutely. And the Kundalini stuff is fun fascinating. I remember actually being with a group of people at Nauth and seeing one of the giant spirals carved on the stone. And something that one of them said was that we should be looking at the spiral in three dimensions, not on a flat surface, that you think about it as emanating and coming up from the earth as yeah, perhaps yeah, an energy yeah. point. And you're linking it there with the chakras is interesting. And the Kundalini, which is something that Joseph Campbell wrote an awful lot about. I just wonder, um, uh, and perhaps I didn't um, explain it uh, as well as I possibly should have in the monograph, is the idea that the serpent energy of Mata and Bowen, that the two things, are, as I say, I've suggested that they're two variants of an ancient myth, but I wonder whether there's something there in addition to the idea of Martha being mother, that there's an idea there connected with exactly what you're saying. But yeah, absolutely deserves more exploration. Yeah, I mean, even just thinking the whole, I mean, St. Patrick, of course, is, is reputed to have got rid of the serpent. Well, what is the serpent? The serpent is this ancient knowledge, you know, that he banished from the country when he brought Christianity. And the whole then idea of a sort of Ida and Pinga, Pingala, which are the two sides, the male and the female, you know, the unification then of the, of the brother and the sister, the, the male and the female energy to come together so that you can have this explosive sort of reunification of knowledge. I think there's really something in the whole sort of um, Sanskrit thing. And I think really that's maybe where you need to go next with your research. Sounds like it. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Auntie. And, uh, uh, lovely to see you again and to hear from you. I'm going to invite um, Joan. I think Joan, Joan, I just have to un ask you to unmute, I think, unless you could do that yourself. I'm not sure I can ask you anyway. Maybe you might ask your question. Can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. Hi, Anthony. How are you? Hello. And a happy solstice to everybody and happy, happy solstice, everyone. Um, I, it's a couple of things, Anthony, um, that gets me there. Um, first of all, um, the Bohan going to the well to uh, not forget her sins, but to try and wash them away. Is that associated with a baptism as in original sin and um uh, cleansing of uh, de de not demons, but certainly um, associated with devil devils uh, and the bad the bad side of life. You know the original sin, and uh, the other thing is why why was it that uh, Bowen was dismembered? Uh, is is that a case that misogyny goes back millennia? Do you know what I mean? That it's the woman that's punished all the time. You know, even in mythology, that it's the woman that's punished all the time. And the other thing is, I'm sorry, I've been taking notes, Anthony. Another thing is, uh, with regards to an eclipse, um, was that ever considered a reunion or a, a mating of um, Dagda and Bowen again, you know, or, or some other deities or... And finally, 
what did the matter actually represent to humans? Was it evil? Was it sin? What was it? You know, what was it destroyed for? And it's there forever in the Liffey, if you know what I mean. So it's there as an example of what not to do because you will be destroyed. I find this very fascinating when it, it, it to me, it's all religion, 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 you know, it's, you know, and I'd love to be able to pick out all the religious bits and to get to the real originals, but we can't. So I'm sorry, Anthony, to take up so much of your time, but. Oh, that's, that's okay. So, so yeah. that's four, that's four questions. <laughs> no, that's sorry. okay. But I should say that I think that what we're looking at in the mythology of Brunabonia in the Denshanicus and in other manuscripts is actually an indication of the religious beliefs of early pre-Christian and prehistoric people. Uh, I can only speculate that. I can, and I'm never going to be able to prove that, I don't think. But I think you can make a case. Uh, so there were four aspects to your question. The first one was about baptism. And I just saw, I don't know whether it was, I was watching a video in the past two days. I don't know if it was Joseph Campbell or whether it was Rupert Sheldrake or Terence McKenna. I can't remember who it was. But they spoke about the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist as being an initiation which I thought was fascinating. Uh, the idea that the neophyte is plunged into the water and basically held there until he drowns. And so when he comes up again, he's an entirely new being, symbolically, of course. Uh, he didn't, John didn't literally drown Jesus, you know. Uh, the notion of baptism, of course, you're right. One of the great difficulties with the Dedenshanicus and any of the myths that were written uh, by the monks is that it can be very difficult to disentangle. Something that's hinted at, by the way, by Lara Cassidy in that paper about NG10 that was published in Nature in 2020, you know, that it can be very difficult. It's a difficult task to disentangle what is uh, original, as it were, pre-Christian and what was added, especially when you consider the religious aspects, especially when you consider those aspects where there may be a question mark. You know, you asked about misogyny. Um, so we have encountered on our live stream series, Live Irish Myths, we have encountered many instances in the stories where, it, you know, women, first of all, invariably in the Irish myths, they're described with notable exceptions as being beautiful. Their beauty is something that's constantly commented on. But then they're described in terms that suggest they are objects. Uh, for instance, uh, the wooing of Etain, we find that uh, Major says to Angus, I want a woman because my eye fell out when I was at Newgrange and I want a woman in compensation. And Angus agrees to go uh, to a king in Ulster called Eileel and say, I want to buy your daughter from you. How much is she? Well, it'll be her weight in silver and gold. And he pays it and your man hands over his daughter as if women were just objects. I have a feeling that some of that is pre-Christian, but... And not a scholar in that uh, regard. I find it sort of interesting that, for instance, it has been suggested that anytime I mention the myth of doubt, Bressal Bodibad brings all the men of Ireland to build him a tower to reach heaven. And of course, the women ask, what were the women doing? Why are the women not mentioned? Um, you know, there's this constant referral to uh, or a stereotyping of roles of men in myth and roles of women in myth. However, some of the women are portrayed heroically. Though in, in Arnia Fingen, which is, I talk about in the monograph, is described as the woman warrior, which suggests that she's more than just a penitent concubine who's gone to the, to, to the well to wash herself of her sin. Undoubtedly, some of the misogyny was introduced by the monks, but was some of it there beforehand? Who can tell, as I say, complex task and good luck with that, because you will <laughs> not get any scholar, no matter what you say, pro or con, no matter what you will say, you won't get any scholar to agree. Uh, there'll always be, I think, a sense of sitting on the fence. It, fascinating what you mentioned about the eclipse, because the same myth about doubt says that the, the king's sister cast a spell on the sun to make it stand still in the sky. Same thing as Newgrange, the standing still of the sun. What happens? The spell is broken because the king commits incest with his sister. They sleep together at uh, a place called the Hill of Sin, uh, which I think is almost certainly a, a Christian intrusion into the myth. And perhaps what we're seeing there is the mingling of sun and moon in the sky. Something that's also referred to, I think, in the same Altrum Chia story that we were talking about, where I shall not come back to the brew until sun and moon, sun, is it sun and moon are mingled and 
sun, sky and earth and sun and moon, something like that. I must uh, re refresh my memory in that regard. Um, so absolutely, without doubt, the culture that built the Brunabonia monuments were knowledgeable about the movements of the moon as well as the sun. There's no way anybody can tell me a complex calendar was based around those two hooks of the year that we call the solstices without mm -hmm. reference to the moon. And as I said in the talk, the full moon at the time of summer solstice would shine into Newgrange and at certain times in the lunar cycle would shine exactly the way the winter solstice sun does. In other words, the same beam except for formed by the pale golden light of a full moon could be seen in the chamber. Mata, what did Mata represent? Well, monsters are always fearful in, in myth, aren't they? Um, they're monsters, they're dragons, you know, uh, George and the dragon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they are, according to Campbell's sort of Jungian interpretation of mythology, they are the fears of your life that you are to overcome. Uh, uh -huh. And in slaying the dragon, you're just literally overcoming the obstacle of your own fears, which prevents you from... Um, progressing to the next phase of your life it's holding you back as it were you know the same sort of idea as the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek that you know oftentimes the dark cave is seen as a place of fear a place where you don't want to go and yet it seems that people liked caves because we have uh, the monuments that were built to replicate a cave-like experience and remember Newgrange has a a, a, a stone slab which was used as a doorway to cut off entry and exit. I think that whoever was in there at the solstice may have been in there for several days, deprived perhaps of food, deprived of their senses to enhance that journey into the other world. Uh, what else the Mata represents? Well, uh, the Mata is, as I said, the primordial beast from whom the parts of the new creation are made. It represents probably the 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 corrupted, the bad, rotten parts of the previous existence, the same existence that is wiped out by the flood of Noah. And, um, you know, this idea that Iliadi talks about, about a, a regenerative cosmos, mm -hmm. the, the beast representing the, the, the decay, uh, the corruption of, uh, of usually, by the way, representing the decay and corruption of the human, uh, not necessarily the entire world, which mm. needs to be killed and slaughtered and caught up. And of course, it's bits, because I think out of the old, the new comes, there's a there's a recognition that we look, we inhabit the same space as we have always done. Uh, and so, you know, there are places on the earth where in previous times, great slaughters were committed, uh, and which are probably sort of, you could walk over them today and not know anything ever took place there. Uh, the idea that the old uh, helps to create the new. I hope that has gone some way to addressing your multifaceted question. <laughs> it has, I'm sorry, Anthony, but it just as you say there about the Massey, just, just to concrete that, in other words, the Massa, the Massa, I know it was destroyed and it's, it, it's it's getting good out of bad or learning from and moving on. However, even in today's world, we have Mata. Mata is everywhere, you know? So therefore that means that it will never die. Is that correct? So we have to, do we just have to learn or? Well, uh, you know, what's the idiom with that, you know? Well, well, you, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of C.G. Young's work and Young would say that the, it is the antinomy of the human condition that we fail to recognize quite often when we objectify or we externalize uh, mm -hmm. ideas and notions such as evil. We've done that in Christianity by saying Satan is the cause of evil. It is something external to us that causes problems. Uh, it, is, it is outside of us. We have basically uh, devolved, we have, we have taken the blame out of ourselves and put yeah. it somewhere else. Uh, whereas Jung, Jung always says that to condemn uh, something in someone else is to condemn the same thing in yourself and uh, not recognizing that we are all capable of great deeds and we are all as humans capable of very dark deeds as well. Yeah. So yeah. Mata uh, essentially uh, in that worldview uh, resides within every one of us. Uh, mm -hmm. And what is the old story about, you know, was it the two wolves? Which one wins? Depends on which one you feed, you know, mm -hmm. the dark wolf or the bright wolf, you know, which mm -hmm. one, which one will you feed the most? Um, mm -hmm. 
a, a recognition of the antinomy is a great starting place of the uh, dichotomy, the essential dichotomy of the human condition, mm -hmm. that uh, there is that uh, uh, th there is that potential within all of us to do very, very wonderful, great, uh, bene beneficent things for our fellow humans and ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also the potential for us to be very destructive. Um, so, yeah, I suppose uh, one answer to your question yeah. would be that Martha is in all of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, love that. Thank you so much, Anthony. No Cheers. problem, Joan. It was a lovely, lovely program tonight. Thank you. Very See glad you that you enjoyed it. Um, Thanks a million. Uh, if anyone else wants to ask a question, please do feel free to indicate now or forever hold your peace because I don't see anyone. I'm just looking through the chat. Um, just looking to see if anybody has a hand up. I think there's a hand up. Jenny Thompson well. does. Is that somebody there? Jenny Thompson. Hello, Jenny. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hello there. Um, thank, you. thank you very much for uh, such an informative one hour lecture, I thought it was very academic and not what I was expecting, Anthony, but thank you. There was lots that I learned. Um, I didn't know an awful lot about Bo and the Goddess. I just knew, knew about the River Boyne and history around that in Boenia, it's White Cow, it's up in Donegal, it's everywhere. Um, I was interested in your different pronunciations around Boen and Boen <laughs> and Boen. And, oh, I was um, fascinated uh, new information around the goddess. Uh, all I had on the information about Bowen the Goddess, you know, was little books or from Newgrange and all that. So I look forward to learning more. Well, as I say, and as I said at the beginning, it is one of the marked features of Bowen that she is famous basically for two reasons, that she drowned while forming the Boyne and that she had an affair with the yeah. dog and bore Angus. And it's like, that's where her story begins and ends for everyone because, it, and it's only when you read the material and there isn't a huge amount of material, but when you read it and you digest it and you get into it, you find that there's actually something a little bit deeper there and that she's probably much more important than is being made exactly, out. Exactly, Anthony, you know? but it, it was almost like, um, uh, sy synchronicity or in coincidence um, when we were we were picking a name for a wee child uh, you might know Barry Malloy do you know Barry Malloy you know what you doesn't matter um, we were picking a name <clears throat> for a wee child and to pick the right name and he came up with Bun, bun, something to do with the river, right? And I came back to him and said, bun, bun. Um, that's the bun, <laughs> right? So we picked the name for our wee child. But it turns out bun was there already. But it turns out <sighs> it's a special name. Mm -hmm. And... Now we're getting to know who Bowen is, thanks to you. <laughs> yeah. I actually don't know anybody. I don't think, I would better be careful before I absolutely say it. I don't think I've ever met anybody whose name is Bowen. I don't think. Right, okay. So I'll give to, you. We'd have to rectify that now. Okay. We have a Bowen, B O F A T A N N. Then we have a friend's daughter who is Wynn. For the Iron Man. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's now, great, sir. Did you have any other question, Jenny? No, I just uh, just wondering. Um, are you doing a thesis, a master's? Did you on Celtic mythology, or what's your specialization? What's my specialization? I'm. Uh, 
I, I much you might call a general practitioner. I just read a lot, you know. I have a lot of interests. I You're a imagine. doctor. No, I mean I'm I'm saying in a metaphorical sense. I'm like a GP of this stuff. I, I don't specialize. I read mythology. I read archaeology. I read astronomy, and I just you know, I don't have any particular specialization. I've just spent twenty two years reading books and find the whole thing very fascinating. Wow. Oh, come here, answer me, just to tell you, little girl and I were tuned in on the couch at seven o'clock and she heard her name, Bowen, <laughs> and she was enamored and then we had to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank well, you. I'm glad to hear that there's more, there's another Bowen in the world. Thanks, Jenny. I'm going to call on, uh, I, I'll take one more question and that's from Bernard Malloy. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Bernard, do I have to ask you to unmute or can you un unmute yourself? Hi, hi Anthony. Thanks. Oh, I've, just un I've just unmuted. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I can uh, indeed, yeah. No, Thanks very much. Very enjoyable talk. No, it's more, more kind of a point I wanted to make. I'm kind of interested in um, the evolution of the provinces of Ireland, the different boundaries. And of course, the Boyne was originally a boundary between the provinces of Ulster and Leinster. If you go right back, and there's references to it in, in different annals, like, you know, but because uh, even like that, there's even references whereby Tara was in Leinster, Telltown was in Ulster, the Boyne was actually the boundary. What I found interesting as well is the, the talk about the Shannon and the Boyne linking, because even if you go right back, if you, if you read the annals, there's talk about Ishnock being the centre of Ireland and Ishnock being the, the centre of the different provinces. And because uh, originally you would have the, but the Boyne going right from, you know, well, if, if, if there's truth or not, who knows, like, no, but the Boyne going right from, uh, you know, be, being the actual boundary of Ulster Lens going right down to um, the Hill of Ishnock. And then you had the River Noor being the ancient boundary between uh, Leinster and Munster. And then, of course, the Shannon then was the ancient boundary of Connacht. And the Erne, then the other side, was a boundary between... All, all, all the provinces are said to have been bound by rivers originally. Mm -hmm. And the Erne was the boundary between Ulster and Connacht, you know? Yeah. And I just find it interesting, this, this, you know, that there's talk about the Shannon and the Boyne, the different rivers of Ireland actually blending into each other. And that kind of links into this, this concept of Ishnock being in the centre. And these four ancient rivers of Ireland kind of flow and underground into Ishnock. But yeah, there's more kind of a point than a question, I suppose. Like, you know? Yeah, it, it is interesting. And I know I've seen it, I don't know where, and it may be in the monograph in a section that I didn't read. But, you know, there was a belief in ancient times that the, the Boyne and the Shannon had, uh, a, you know, a single source. And we now know that that's not the case. However, there are tributaries of the Shannon and tributaries of the Boyne, which feed out yeah. of the Midlands, which feed out at the same place. Um, I, I think it's more a notional thing, the idea of Segish being the sort of sacred pool from which these great rivers are birthed. It's very interesting. I'm also interested in uh, the boundaries. Um, so, for instance, when Amergin was adjudicating over the division of the kingdom be be between Eremon and Eber, uh, the first Milesian kings, uh, yeah. the Boyne was the division marker in the east Um yeah. The Boyne River. And in fact, one of the traditions of the Mill Mount, the great mound upon which the Martello Tower sits in Drogheda, yeah, is yeah. that it was built uh, as a sort of a boundary marker overlooking yeah. the river between the two kingdoms. And then yeah. the Boyne is also divides the kingdoms of two of the five Fervolog kings. And Slonia yeah. had the yeah. greatest That's division. Right. Wasn't he put the Boyne to the, to the estuary of the three sisters? Was yeah. it, I think, um, and again, the Boyne is the, est yeah. is the estuary in that case. Yeah. Of course, uh, we shouldn't be at all surprised because, you know, a, a huge amount of townlands in Ireland are bounded yeah. by streams and rivers and water courses, you yeah. know. It's like it's the most natural way to make a division of yeah. land, which true. always struck me as interesting. When you look at the, med the layout of medieval Irish towns and then you look at maps of modern American cities, American yeah. cities are made up in blocks and it's parallels, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's squares and, and, and parallel lines and rectangles. And Irish towns never look like that, but yeah. that's because we're based on a much, a much older system. Interestingly, also about the Boyne, yeah. uh, and it's something may, maybe to include in a future expanded version of the monograph, is a section about this. The Boyne in Drogheda has always been seen as a river of division rather than a river of unity. So, for instance, uh, traditionally, when I was born, it's changed now because the county councils have spoken to each other and 
Louth has expanded. But yeah. it used to be that if you're on the north side of Drogheda, uh, yeah. north of the Boyne, you were in Louth, south yeah. you were in Meath. Yeah. You also had, as you say, you had you used to have Ulster, the, the province of Oriel was north of the river. Yeah. It used to be, it's still the case that the Archdiocese yeah. of Armagh Perhaps, reaches yeah. the Boyne. And if you go south of the Boyne, you're into the yeah. Diocese of Meath. True. Uh, and no wonder then that yeah. apparently at the time the Normans originally came to Ireland, there were two separate towns of Drogheda and, yeah. and they had separate charters. And there was yeah. a charter of unification issued at some point. And also the fact that still to this day, residents of this town, if you live yeah. on the north side, you refer to the south siders as far siders. You know, oh, you're yeah, from the yeah, far yeah. side and, yeah. and, and vice versa. It's yeah. almost as if this rivalry has been going on for centuries and perhaps even longer. Um, it's a very interesting point. Yeah. The Boyne, you're right, is a very yeah. major divisional marker uh, in aspects of yeah. uh, mythological history. Yeah. Do you know what's interesting, interesting as well, Anthony? I, I was going to go on to this. I, I've studied the Irish language and the different dialects of the Irish language. And even right up to the 1800s, when, when a lot of Ireland was just speaking Irish, Loud spoke Ulster Irish and a lot of Northern Mead. Northern Mead, going right into Trim, you know, spoke the Ulster dialect of Irish. A lot of oh, people wow. don't realise that. Yeah. yeah, so the, even even the even the point was a linguistic barrier between Ulster Irish and say Leinster Irish, and even if you go to the other side, if you go to, to, to the River Erne, the country from Anna, and goes down to the middle of Cavan, the Erne was a boundary between Ulster and Connacht Irish. Even go through Cavan, Western Cavan spoke Connacht Irish, Eastern Cavan spoke wow. Ulster Irish. You know what I mean? So so even even accents, I, I'd even go further. If you go to the accents of uh, from Anna, the other side of the the air, go and say west and south, quite distinctive from the rest of Ulster. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, no. So, so I think there's a lot of things around today which have echoes from our past. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That can be found in rivers, but anyway, there you go. Like, so, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. an interesting thought. It hadn't yeah. struck me about the accents. And, and, that. and one more thing that actually is the no, the Nore as well. The Nore that goes through Kilkenny. That was the ancient boundary between Ulster and uh, sorry between Leinster and Munster. The Irish that was spoken on the eastern bank of the Nore and that part of Kenny was 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 Leinster Irish and the other side was Munster Irish come down to the middle of Kenny and that was in the 1800s as well do you know what I mean like you know and the thing is you know all these kingdoms and even like whenever the there are say the, the Normans the English came to Ireland around the Norman or you know the 1600s all the the idea of the concept of, of provinces were long gone you know you had all these kingdoms which went across rivers or was whatever like you know there even are maps of Ireland from that period where the English or the British went to the locals to ask them what, what is what. And they're still, you, see, you, can, you can find these maps which show Connacht having the urn as its boundary, going right down to the middle, middle of, you know, you know, what was now Fermanagh, like, you know what I mean, or, or Clare being part of Connacht. But none of these boundaries were, were in, in political reality. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know I mean? like, yeah, so yeah. they're still going to the local people. The local people are saying one thing, whereas the aristocracy were saying, well, this is our kingdom. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, so there so still was that, that tradition. Sorry, I'm going on here. We look like, no, no. It's very interesting. Something, I, something I'm also very interested in. Yeah. Cool. yeah. The old, the old yeah. divisions. Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Let Quinn and let Moga and all of that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Bernard. Very yeah. glad to have you along this evening. Folks, thank you for uh, tuning in. I'm re I realize that we're now sort of at, uh, approaching an hour and three quarters. Uh, uh, I'll just say thanks. Uh, I enjoyed uh, having you along this evening. The talk will be published on YouTube uh, in the next probably 24 hours. In the meantime, happy winter solstice to you. My uh, gracious thanks to Loud Library Service for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it was my great pleasure to do so. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in the material, just to refer again to the fact that uh, the books uh, can be can be bought on the Mythical Ireland website, mythicalireland.com, signed by the author and dispatched worldwide. In the meantime, have a very happy rest of the winter solstice. Of course, from tomorrow onwards, the days slowly but gradually begin to turn again. And uh, that brings with it a sense of renewed hope and light. And of course, with everything that's going on in the world at the moment, that light would be very welcome. Also, to extend to you a very happy Christmas, hope you all have a very enjoyable, peaceful Christmas and a very happy new year. For those of you who regularly watch the live streams, we're back on Monday evening with Live Irish Myths. In the meantime, good night from Drogheda, good night from the Boyne Valley. Thank you for joining us tonight and all the very best to every one of you. Togabogay, as they say. <laughs>